um, we're going face to face for smart culture. Right. Still morning. Yes, it is still morning. Um, where, uh, what are some of the um, your techniques that I can see? Are they are they in your uh, are they in the um, uh, fabrics that you're using or um, in the clothing techniques that you're using or where do you, your Mark Mitchell uh -huh. secret technique that you use, where do you use them, on what media do you use them? Um, I use them here and there and everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. they're little cutting things that I know about when you're cutting patterns. Um, mm -hmm. There's some little pattern cutting tricks that I know that make clothing more flattering on the body. And a lot of people don't know some of these little tiny quarter of an inch. I'm talking about a quarter of an inch that can really speak volumes, you know. Um, and a lot of people don't don't know those things. So I don't always share those things. My assistants now, the, the people that I've worked with, the young people I've worked with over the years that I've taught, I've let them observe everything. I don't keep secrets from them. But I also trust them with my life. They wouldn't share. But I'm happy to pass it on to them. So I'm not really being selfish with them. But there's stuff that I don't teach. Like teach publicly when I'm teaching. There's stuff that I would never teach. Like I'll never teach uh, silk flower making. I did one time as I was learning. It was part of my. I knew I wanted to learn how to make silk flowers in a traditional way, um, in the way that they're made uh, for couture gowns out of silk. And I knew I wanted to learn that. And so the first thing I did was schedule a class to teach, because that's like okay. Now I really have to learn some things because I have to teach these people. And so that's how I learned the basics. And then I spent a year or so, you know, experimenting and practicing and working out different formulas and working out different tricks and techniques. And, you know, the more you do it, the more you learn. And so suddenly now I have the skill that I didn't have before. And I'm not sharing that <laughs> with anyone because it was hard to learn. <laughs> how funny. long did it take you, uh, your, uh, uh, your ex to come up with the pieces for your uh, prime music? Uh, for burial, I think I worked on that for a year and two or three months, something like that. It was nine ensembles, head to toe. So each person had a minimum of four pieces that they were doing. Did you see it when you were designing? Did you see it nine pieces? How did you see it? I don't, I'm not sure how I wound up at nine. Um, nine just seemed to be the finishing spot. Um, the first few I conceptualized right away, as soon as the idea had taken form. Um, the first couple I knew right away what I wanted to do. I knew who the models would be and I knew what I wanted the garments to generally look like. And then it just sort of grew from there and grew into sort of this organic group of people who were friends and models and um, people that I knew and I just sort of cast this group of nine uh, for various reasons and um, yeah I'm not sure if I answered your question I think I wandered off somewhere okay, uh, what well, it was a live performance installation it was a live mm -hmm. performance why did why did you do what you did you had live you had people right. well there. each of the ensembles were designed specifically for the person that was wearing it it was not only fit to them, but it was designed for them in particular. So what I was working with at that time was trying to sort of define an essence of how I saw that person and sort of an elevated they at their best self. Um, so the conceit was that these were their clothes for eternity. So if they were to be dressed for eternity, what would they be wearing? And so that was my question to myself, and that's how everything, everything grew from that. If I, if I got to make one outfit for you, then I get to choose what it is, and it's going to be what you're going to wear for eternity. For eternity. I don't care about your wedding dress. For the other. Make, I want to make what you're going to wear forever. For your other life? <laughs> yes, other the next life. life. The next, I'm sorry, yeah, that's a good yeah. one. That's a good one. That's a nice so one. that was part of that. That was, that's, that was sort of the... Um, lighter hearted part of that. Um, this, I would call it, uh, earlier we, were, we talked about it. it, it looks to me like a collection, a collection mm -hmm. that with a fashion designer designed. Um, 
when you were designing it, why or how did you have you have you done anything like that of a collection? Well, I like designed for the theater. You designed for the theater. So I designed plays, which in a way is like designing a collection. There's an overarching concept, and right. then you have the individuals that are dictated in the play by the characters of the play. So it's a little bit different than a fashion collection in that regard. Right, in that regard. But uh, how did you, what was the, and we've talked about it prior to, to this, but uh, the, what does it mean to you? What did it mean to you to have those pieces designed and show them to the public? That bureau, I don't say it right, uh, um, the collection uh, bureau. Burial. 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 What What is the meaning to you of that collection, of those pieces? Well, it was a tribute to really lost friends and lost loved ones and lost mentors, people I had lost in my life due to AIDS mostly or drugs. And that sense of loss I carried with me for a very long time, and I needed to get it out. I needed to exercise it, and that was my way of doing that, frankly. It helped me put to rest a lot of uh, things that there wasn't time to put to rest at the time. That things happened, if that makes any sense. I talk about that a little bit in the mm -hmm. film that we were talking about. So mm -hmm. it's that, that's, that's what it was about, really. Um, and it was my sort of question to the world, are we valuing these people, look at, look at this particular group of people, look at these particular people that I drew together for particular reasons, and imagine what it would be like if we lost all nine of them in a day. Imagine what a loss to the city if all nine of those people had ceased existing at that time. They're all artists and people that are vital to the city. They're all people that are valuable to the city. And and that's what happened during uh, uh, the AIDS years. We were losing people right and left, and losing, losing some of the best and brightest, just gone forever. So um, it was about appreciating what we have and treasuring the people that we have now and treasuring their talents and their skills. Um, yeah. So it was quite small. Yeah. Oh, very much so. All that, as we've talked before, uh, your dark. <laughs> My dark ages. Your dark ages. Your dark yeah, ages. it was a long time in the wilderness, believe me. Right. Um, <coughs> what is next for you? Um, mm. We've kind of talked, we had a question about but what do you want to do next? And I know you're moving, mm -hmm. so uh, you you're going to be back. And, um, and at least to survive those hot days. <laughs> so what do you see yourself Doing more of? Doing more of? I like what I'm doing because I'm doing a little bit of everything. This year I spent about six months doing artwork, doing contemporary artwork, uh, like the dynamite sculpture I showed you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've spent the last six months of the year, I'm spending the last six months of the year um, doing costume commissions and garment commissions and, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I did a play. I'm going to Beirut to show my work and to collaborate on a, a production there. Um, what else do I have going on? There's something other than that, too. Um, I've got a lot going on, and as long as I get to decide what those projects are, <laughs> as long as the universe keeps providing uh, really exciting opportunities, I'm going to keep doing different things. I don't ever want to have to do the same thing again and again and again. That's the most... I, that's one of the reasons my, why my pieces are one of a kind, is because I can't stand to make something twice. It makes me crazy. Um, it's so boring to me, <laughs> and I'm so spoiled. But that's just, just has part of become who I am as an artist and as a maker of clothing, is that I never do the same thing twice because it's so boring. I'll try and copy something that I've made, and I make it in a different way. It just doesn't... I can't make a stack of things. I can't do it. The, those two pieces, tell me a little bit more about those beautiful uh, creations of yours. The um, black is a burlesque costume um, based on a Victorian widow's mm. costume. And so. And that's going to be a costume, obviously. That's a costume for, for a burlesque artist. For and that's the bonnet that goes with it, which I'm quite proud of. 
I always wanted to make a nice bonnet. Can I try it on? Sure. I'll put it on. It's polyester. So, so, <laughs> yeah, it's, so, so it's not finished to the degree that yeah. I would finish. This is costume. So it's, work. Yeah. it's solid, uh, it's but, solid not, but not up close. It's not as beautiful as if, as if I had made it for a for a real client or something, yeah. or a, and someone who's going to wear it in real life. Yeah. So. I always wanted to make one of those, and I never got the chance. <laughs> it's pretty chic, actually. <laughs> so, and then you um, cut and dye each. Like this one, we talk more about your, this piece for the client, right? That's, That's for another red client. Carpet. That's a red carpet uh, and performance look for a client. And I made all the silk flowers. They're all individually, each petal is individually cut and shaped and colored. and. Uh, sewn together, there's no glue, it's all sewing. So it's silk, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It's all silk. So, yeah, and each by each. Those are all silk. So, and they're strung on silk. Yeah, they said that. And you dye each, uh, each piece? Not know? each not petal, each but each Not each petal, petal but yeah. So tell me more about, um, I mean, it takes, and we've talked about it, but it's, it's beautiful, let me put this, um, I'll put this back, and then um, each piece that you work on, it's so time consuming. Um, it's, as I, as I see, it's always a meditation, right? Your meditation that takes you to your, within, takes you somewhere. And uh, you said it helped you, it helped you to, what did, what helps you to, what helped you to come out of that dark times? What, what helped you? Transitioning from dark to light, see the light. I think growing up, it's part, partly growing up, I had a case of arrested development for a while there, and it, partially it was just growing up and learning how to be an adult. And, and then working to capacity, which is something I had never really had to, had, ha, I hadn't done for quite some time, uh, because part of being on the dark side was being quite lazy, and um, so it was nice not to be lazy, and that really, I believe, hard work and pushing yourself and learning, constantly learning, is the most energizing and light-filled thing that you can do, so I think work, and certainly my partner, I mean, there are personal reasons, of course, that, uh, that those times change. But as far as my work is concerned, it's just a matter of being more and more devoted to my art practice. And uh, that has loosened me up as far as doing fashion work and design work because when when I considered myself primarily a designer, um, there was somehow, and this is just myself, there were just limitations that I put on myself that now that I consider myself an artist and I consider fashion and costume sort of my second job, my day job, if you will, mm. that's my day job, um, I have less limitations on what I will allow myself to do, which is kind of an interesting dichotomy. I don't quite understand it, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate it. It frees me up to do a lot of stuff that I would have stopped myself from doing before. And you've talked about the limitations that you had in your childhood that prevented you to do what you wanted to do and express yourself how you wanted to talk about that. Well, I grew up in a very small, backward place, and um, being a boy and wanting to learn things about needlework or embroidery or knitting or all the things that I was interested in, it wasn't appropriate. It wasn't gender appropriate, so I was shamed for it. And I had, you know, an aunt who was quite proficient at all of those things, but would not teach me because I was a boy, and so it was frustrating. And so I turned that to my advantage, I think. You can use revenge as a great uh, <laughs> revenge is a great driving force. I mean, so revenge, that's your that was living your long is the best revenge. No, I haven't had my revenge yet. I'm still working. Uh, on still it. working. It's a on lifetime it. project. Yeah. It's a lifetime project. Yeah. Um, 
What um, can you show me the? Um, you showed me, but is it okay if you show me again a little dynamite um, piece? Sure. The dynamite piece. Um, and you said that um, you mentioned that um, it takes well, we all know that it takes so much have to go into time. Box. Yeah, I'm not go gonna in, yeah, we're not easy. gonna take it out because it's. Soak. I don't want to touch it. Yeah, I don't want to touch it because it stains. Soap it stains yeah. oils from the from the fingers. It right. stains the um, and changes the color. It should of the, be wrapped in acid-free paper right now, but it's not. Yeah, and it was presented in an acrylic, right, white mm -hmm. box at the. Um, out of sight. Uh, out of sight. The sh art show at the King Street Station yeah, the during King. the art fair. Mm -hmm. And now the pieces that you have from the uh, uh, installation, right, fry installation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Those are all the boxes over there. Bur bur burial. Bur burial. And then <laughs> probably I will be able to know. Um, you need to take care of those pieces. Yeah, for sure. I'm about to repack them all because I'm taking quite a bit of it to Beirut. So it's about all to be repacked and steamed and um, it's been packed away for about a year and a half, two years, and so it's time to air it out and change the paper and make sure it's, you know, being maintained as well as I can afford to maintain it. Yeah, because it takes time and uh, the time and uh, the, the, the temperatures and the lighting uh, to take care of things that uh, eventually will decay. And then tell me more about what your intention to make this uh, their organic, well, organic cut. All the pieces, all those pieces, all the art pieces are organic, all organic materials. No glue, they're all sewn instead of glued. And um, Well, I even sew these costume pieces uh, because it's easier to me to sew than it is to glue. Um, <laughs> find glue is a very mm -hmm. pleasant task. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what I was saying. Oh, What's the why would it uh, uh, why would be so important for you to make those pieces that uh, eventually will go away? Then? Well, that's just a reminder that we're all we'll go. <laughs> we're all going somewhere. <laughs> we're all going at some point. Nobody gets out of here alive. You know, I'm aware of that on the day to day on a daily basis. You know, every day I say, "Let's hope I don't get hit by a car today." Yeah. I say that to myself. I do not want to get hit by a car. I don't want, I'm very risk averse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I probably don't look like a risk averse person, but I am a very risk averse person mm -hmm. now. Because I don't want to die of something stupid when I have so much more to do. I feel like I have a lot of work to do. Yeah. So the, um, the pieces that are, it's, um, it's, um, as we said, you know, it's time consuming, but uh, it's the whole history behind the, dressmaking for dead people. Mm -hmm. It's not in Western culture, making clothing for the dead has never been a big deal. They've always been, the things that have been available commercially have been very um, sad, sort of mm -hmm. tragic. The research I did, there were some really pathetic looking things that people have been, that are offered, and what's offered right now as very aware, if you're unfortunate enough to go to a traditional funeral home mm -hmm. and have to buy something from them to put the body in. Terrifying. They're really quite terrible. I quite seriously considered going into burial wear as a real thing, as not as an art project, but as an, an actual business. business. I really considered it. I mm -hmm. think there's probably a market there for well-designed, well-made, mm -hmm. attractive, simple burial clothing, but I just didn't have it in me to do it. I'm not a business person. I'm an artist, and I can't. I can't <laughs> resolve that. <laughs> I've never been able to resolve that. Yeah. When I was um, um, doing research, um, reading some um, information about you and, and uh, your kind of background and uh, watching the documentary, I looked at, I found uh, on YouTube um, a video of the, of the women that are making clothes for um, uh, babies that are that die, and so to bring some, some peace to parents. Um, so I think it's, uh, it can be very um, curing mm -hmm. uh, for families, for example, that uh, lost sure. a newborn, for example, to make, uh, um, to make something that 
the angel wear they call it angel mm-hmm. it uh, brings some peace um, um, to those families and I think can be yeah potentially can be um, it's like the farewell huh? the final farewell uh, very much so. um, like what you did with your um, installations the farewell of those that, that mentored you and brought um, where where do you see what I know it's um, quite hard to find now mentors uh, emerging designers for those that uh, um, use um, uh, that want to create clothing and um, I think it's uh, quite hard to find those here in Seattle and you're going away now I know you're teaching classes I'm not really teaching at the moment, yeah, but, um, but you were. I was teaching, yeah. and I, I like to teach, and I, I've always had at least an assistant that I've been teaching, and so um, I have two people that I've been working with in costume design and in clothing making, and um, they're I'm really proud of both of them. They've learned a lot, and, and, and they're um, local. They're local. They're local. They're local. local. Yeah. And so I'm looking forward to seeing what they do after I'm gone. You know, there are new people in Tucson to teach, so I'll find people there too. So I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm what, excited about my new life. The new life. Uh, what are some of the people that you consider, um, or the people in? Uh, I know Opera House has very extended uh, department costume mm-hmm. department. Very much so. Yeah, they do. They get to do some wonderful work, but the most exquisite costumes in the city are probably from the ballet. They do everything to the, just the most precise. Really? Have you worked degree. there? I have not worked there, no. Um, In but the Pacific, right? The Pacific Northwest. Pacific Northwest. Northwest Ballet. Ballet. Um, their costume shop is uh, Primo. Just Primo. Probably the best in the city. I don't think that uh, many designers know that, yeah. that the opportunities are there. It's um, For some reason, it's the... Uh, the the connections between the connection between designers and, and um, um, entities like opera house and ballet and theater. I think it's this disconnect. And uh, I don't from think fashion. That, from mm-hmm. fashion, I don't think that many people know. I mean, many many designers, emerging designers, know about. Well, it's a different sort of training, though. Um, most people that that. Um, go to school to study to be fashion designers are learning a very different set of skills than it means to be a theatrical designer, whether it's for the opera or the ballet or for the theater. It's a really different set of skills that you need to have. Um, Because in the theater and in the ballet and in the opera, you're making usually one of a kind. You're not making to mass produce. But in fashion, you're trained to mass produce your work. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very different set of skills. Mm -hmm. Um, and a very different approach. So I think that's the reason more than anything that there's not a lot of overlap. But there is some overlap. They did a production of the Pearl Fishers up here at the Opera mm-hmm. just recently, the design of Rhodes design. Mm-hmm. So that happens for sure. Isaac Mizrahi designs for the theater. Mm-hmm. A lot of people design for the theater. Valentino just did the most precious La Traviata. Sure, I've seen it. Uh, just mm-hmm. gorgeous with yeah. the black and blue ombre. Oh, it was absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really stunning little gem of a production. So, I'm lucky I get to cross over. I get to do a little bit of everything. And I usually have enough different things going on that I get to pick every day what I get to do. It's like, do I want to work on this costume today or do I want to work on this dress? And so I'm pretty spoiled when it comes to doing my work. I get to do what I want to do for the most part. Yeah. And that's a rare gift. I love that. What you see, I know the king... King Station has the, on the third floor, they have the, uh, now the space for the artists, mm-hmm. um, and that's where you were doing your... That's where, uh, yeah. I showed some work there. Some of the yeah. What are some of the artists that you think are in Seattle that we should know? Oh, you should know Tariqa Waters is absolutely amazing, and also very fashionable and gorgeous looking. She does what with, with She's an artist. She does all kinds of art. She's amazing. Google her. Tarika okay. Waters. Okay, we will. And John Chris Chitello is someone who I think a lot of. He's done a lot of uh, work about gentrification and um, 
he's very funny and wonderful person and a wonderful artist and very very smart and I love him um, so yeah John Cristicello and Tarika Waters those are the people who art wise I'm waving their flag right now oh I want to no some other people Andrew Lamb Schultz is amazing um, Jordan Christensen is a young person who makes clothing and is actually really just being amazing and to watch him grow over the last few years has been fantastic um, there's all sorts of good people um, who else should I mention mm -hmm. I mentioned Andrew John too. Mm -hmm. those are the ones right at the top of my head and I apologize for anybody else I'm leaving no it's nothing personal anything else that you would want to say um, I feel like I've been talking for a really long time so I think we've talked Thank you for uh, giving a glimpse into your um, life. Um, I hope you're going to be back, um, and um, maybe in the future you can have you can have more of Mark Mitchell. Uh, um, maybe again, I don't know, museums or galleries, so you can see, go and see. Hopefully, and you will come up with. I've got a group of work that I'm working on, but it's not going to be ready for a little while. And I have to take a break and work on some easy stuff. Right. So, I have to, I have to add my break yeah. involves going to work in Beirut and everything else. So, I don't really yeah. take a break, it's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see more of you because um, you have a, such a vast um, base of knowledge. Um, that, that Designers, not only designers, but the artists need to see. So yeah. I'm gonna keep working. I'll die working. I'm not gonna stop. Oh yeah, that's what I live for. I love it. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, uh, thank you. Bye. Ciao. We've been talking for about... We've been talking for... And, oh, yeah, wow. almost, yeah.